and good evening to all. Uh, the mandate to today is to talk on uh, pulmonary metastatic means and uh, I have labeled this talk as best practices uh, considering the levels of evidences that we do have in this and I think with the growing popularity of the LGS series I think uh, what has happened is I think the lockdown has also sort of been sort of extended in Chennai so I think uh, people will have more time to sort of prude and or be academics. Uh, anyway thank you Dr. Patta again for the opportunity always a pleasure to be in this platform. Uh, with regards to pulmonary metastatectomies, we find that uh, lung is, in fact, a very common site for metastasis for malignant tumors. Up to one-fifth to half of the patients who die of any cancer would have almost a nodule or metastasis in the lung. Historically, if you see, the standard treatment of pulmonary metastasis was supportive care. I used to remember uh, some of my teachers telling in the training that uh, if you see in a chest x-ray a lesion, a nodular lesion suggestive of metastasis, and especially so if it was a sarcoma, then you could sort of, you know, very well send the patient home the same day. Uh, well, that was the practice at that particular point of time, but over the decades, a lot of things have changed. Now we know that we are in a multidisciplinary mode and multidisciplinary approaches have taken shape in the management of pulmonary metastasis as well. A few of the patients who have been offered palliative chemotherapy, and this was uh, initially to start off with, but we know that because of palliative chemotherapy, the extent of survival benefit that we get is very less. Metastatectomies were starting to be increasingly performed uh, ever since maybe around uh, two to three decades now. But even now, if you see that number of metastatectomies are actually very infrequent. For the number of series we have, only about five, one to six percent of all cancer patients who have metastasis would actually undergo metastatic. So although the numbers have increased over the past two to three decades, the proportion of patients undergoing metastatectomies has been very less around one to 6.5 percent. And there is, there is a lot of recent evidences that are favoring an aggressive treatment for pulmonary metastasis. And this is what I'm going to sort of touch about in the course of my talk. Again, a lot of my talks are all, literally all my talks have been evidence-based. And if you see the evidence pertaining to pulmonary metastatectomies, we don't have any randomized control trials, any robust randomized control trials, let me put it that way. Over a thousand trials have happened in the field of pulmonary metastasis from 1980 to possibly now, but none of them have been robust randomized control. What we do have is a majority of the retrospective studies, some of course good prospective series have been there, but in all their numbers have been modest in various series. Some series have a tumor agnostic criteria, some series have selected primaries. By and large we have heterogeneity, the patient characteristics, and when it comes to case selection, there is a perversive case selection and I would come to exactly what it means. Considering that pulmonary metastasis is a part of a metastatic process, there is an increasing role or important role rather of systemic therapies. And if you see in the data of pulmonary metastasis, it has been pretty much inconsistent. And subsequently, even the follow-ups of the patients which have been published have been very much variable. Now, there is a lot of issues of the controls in the cohort of patients that have been published. A majority of the series that have been published have actually no control population. So it was just about a <clears throat> case cohort study and some of the series actually compared the data with historical controls. And we know that a lot of the historical controls, the survival rate, uh, rates were in the range of 0 to 5%, but select series actually said that the survival rates could increase from up to 29%. It all began with the landmark trial, and this is called the International Registry for Lung Metastasis, which was started in 1991. Uh, enrolled close to about more than 5,000 patients. It, it was published in 1997. And this study actually said that the five-year survival rate in the patients who underwent an R0 resection, that is a resection with clear margin, was better than an incomplete resection. So we didn't say the superiority of pulmonary metastatectomy over uh, not, not doing a pulmonary metastatectomy, because that was, that was not the mandate of the trial. And mind you, in this trial also, there was no control group of non-operated patients. However, being a first registry of sorts, 
it became a pillar of modern thoracic surgery that is pulmonary metastatectomy after the publication of these trials and around for a close to a decade there has been increasingly popular use of pulmonary metastatectomy as a mode of treatment for the pulmonary metastasis so this was a study the irlm study was based on all cancers and this study of colorectal cancers was a systematic review and meta analysis of around 24 large studies more than 2500 patients published in the annals in 2013 the five year survival rate was around 42% of the patients who had a pulmonary metastasis and again there were no control groups in this cohort of patients so the critics actually said that the benefit that of improved survival that we are observing this patient may not definitely be attributable to pulmonary metastatectomy it could be because of the influence of systemic therapy and the reason why they said is there was a heavy selection bias in each of these series the patients who were treated with non operative therapies invariably had advanced disease and and resectable disease then there was this interesting study by sala this was in a subgroup of osteosarcoma patients of resectable metastasis so when they divided the resectable metastasis into metastatectomy versus no metastatectomy were what they found is the group that that did not undergo metastatectomy had a five times higher risk of progression and a four times higher risk of death stating that metastatectomy is definitely useful but mind you this was not a randomized control trial there was only one attempted randomized control trial and this is called the pulmonary metastatectomy trial in colorectal cancers so this was a trial on colorectal cancer primaries it's called the pulmic trial they had consented around 512 patients but only 65 were able to be randomized and i will come to the reasons for the close uh, for slow accrual and there is inherent problems of the randomized control trials but what they interestingly published and this was the study published by tom treasures group in the trials in december 2019 what they found in, in the well matched control group of around 47 patients they had a five year survival rate of 29% and this was against the traditionally believed control group survival of 0 to 5% they so they actually questioned the benefit of pulmonary metastasis pulmonary metastatectomies and mind you this is only in the cohort of colorectal cancers and not in any other cancers despite this trial published in december 2019 the uk nice guidelines and this trial was also from the uk uk nice guidelines and this was published earlier in january 2020 it actually recommended surgical resection or metastatectomies along with other ablative techniques in the management of metastasis from colorectal cancers however the uk guidelines also said that the evidence was limited poor quality and there was a lack of randomized control trials so what are the challenges actually of performing a randomized control trial in the setting of pulmonary metastatectomies one of course we discussed it's a very very heterogeneous group tumor burden may be different in different groups and so will be the performance status of patients also with regards to the extent and location there could be very much variable and there is an element of physician bias for example in the pulmonary trial about 100 or close to around 70 to 80 patients the physicians actually overturned the decision of the randomization and close to about 45 patients actually overturned the decision of the randomizations so what we see is that there is a lot of physician bias and the patient bias inherently in the selection of treatment for or against pulmonary metastasis so that's the reason why you don't really have good randomized control trials although you do have a lot of patients who could be eligible for enrollment in these trials so now if you come to the various primaries in which that normally metastasize to the lung and then wherein you can do a surgery it is mainly sarcomas colorectal tumors and testicular tumors breast kidneys melanomas and head neck cancers do metastasize to the lung but the performance of metastatectomies in this cohort of primaries is very very less In fact the top two cancers as we see as sarcomas and colorectal cancers interestingly there is an indian and a western divide in west you find that colorectal primaries are the more common causes of metastasis and metastatectomies whereas in the indian population there have been three studies and we had published one of our data along with the, some of the data from the all india institute and the tatas what we found that 
is sarcomas are the more common cause for pulmonary metastasis and metastatic disease. Of course, testicular cancers, it's a, it's a systemic disease. Chemotherapy takes care of it very well, it, but it, does, it is worthwhile to do metastatectomy in testicular cancers as well. So as a net result, what happens is that there is no robust high-level evidence supporting the justification to do a pulmonary metastasis. There are contrarian viewpoints. I told you one view over the other view. So what we will try to do now is try to review what is the best thing clinical practice to do. So what do you do when a patient of pulmonary metastasis presents to you in a clinic? And first, prior to going to the best practices, we must understand certain terminologies. Now, synchronous and metachronous are pretty basic terminologies, and I'm sure that most of you are aware of this. But what has been there in the metachronous cohort is there is a classification of early versus later. This is not something that is standardized, but this is some suggestion. And what has actually revolutionized the practice of various cancers, uh, various solid tumors, is the concept of oligometastatic disease. And I would discuss this sometime later. There are three other terminologies of oligometastatic disease, de novo, repeat, and induced. And I would actually discuss each of them very briefly in my subsequent part of the talk. And for each of them, we have, based on the response for systemic therapy, uh, terminologies like oligorecurrent, oligoprogressive, and oligopersistent. So these are the terminologies one must be aware of prior to having a, a, an understanding of the concept of pulmonary metastatic. Now, this was a population-based study published from Spain, and it was, it was, this was there two days back, published in the British Journal of Surgery. And they said, they defined synchronous as any tumor that could be present either at the time of diagnosis or within six months of diagnosis, that is metastasis. Or early metachronus would be between six to 12 months, and late metachronus would be more than 12 months. I think the significance of the study was that Synchronous resection, it's a slightly busy slide, so I would try to sort of sum it up by saying a synchronous resection was better than no resection, a metachronous resection was better than no resection, and a late metachronous resection was better than an early metachronous resection. So this is what it says, that is, the chronicity matters. If it's a synchronous resection, it tends to do poorly as compared to a metachronous resection, but uh, resecting a synchronous lesion is actually better than doing a no, no resection. And even in the metachronous resections, that is, if, if, the, if the metastasis presents after six months, a late metachronous resection, that is, performance of surgeries for tumors that are metastasis after one year or progressively after that, they have a better survival than the early metachronous resections, that is, between six to 12 months. Now, the concepts of metastasis have been laid down by Tomford in 1965, and much of this has not changed. What it entails is that you have to have a primary tumor that is controlled or controllable, if it's the case of a synchronous metastasis. There is an absence of extrathoracic metastasis, but this concept is challenged by the concept of the oligometastatic disease, which I'll discuss later. <coughs> More importantly, <coughs> Sorry. More importantly is the concept of technical resectability, which is very, very important. And also is the importance of having a good functional thoracic risk. That is the patient, the ability of the patient to tolerate the resection is more important. So not only should the resection be technically feasible to ach achieve an R0 resection, but the patient should also be in a good general performance status to tolerate the resection. Now, how do you go about evaluating these patients? And as a standard imaging, a CT chest is mandatory for planning any metastasectomy. And in the setting of metastasis, I think a PET CT scan has a distinct advantage of ruling out the extrathoracic disease. And there are a lot of CT criteria for diagnosis of metastasis. And this criteria has come from the screening studies for solitary pulmonary nodules. And a lot of that data has been extrapolated in the evaluation of CT scans for pulmonary metastasis patients. But mind you, CT chest has its own limitations and we know that limitations are there. In up to a third of the patients, it could underestimate the disease. And up to a third of the patients, actually the nodules that were believed to be metastasis would turn out to be benign. But now over the years, there have been a lot of technological advances in the CT scan. We have got greater scans, helical scans with volumetric analysis data as well. Mm -hmm. So 
radiologists are able to better pick the nodules but it's very important from the thoracic surgeon or sur the surgeon who is performing the metastasis to consent the patients because not all the uh, palpable pulmonary nodules can be detected preoperatively so very quite often what happens is preoperatively you would find up to some three three nodules but post operative or intraoperatively rather you would possibly see nodules may be slightly larger and as always some of the nodules which were pre presumed to be in metastasis would turn out to be rather benign there's also this concept of localization techniques and this is very important in the management of pulmonary nodules intraoperatively how do you actually go about localizing intraoperative palpation is the main method you could aid yourselves by doing an intraoperative ultrasound a ct scan or any other percutaneous localizations or a preoperative localizations are becoming more and more popular in fact preoperative localizations are pretty commonly used for screen detected or mammographically detected mm -hmm. cancers and the same technology has been extrapolated in lung cancer management the hook wire is a more commonly used thing but again unlike in breast cancers if you put a hook wire in the lung there is a higher incidence of pneumothorax so you may have up to about 40 percent of the patients having a pneumothorax uh, in some series that have been reported apart from the hook wires you could use coils or dyes the newer technologies is to do with radio guided localization and navigation bronchoscopy now, what are the approaches that are there? Again, there are the open approaches and the minimally invasive approach. And open, of course, you could do it with a thoracotomy, a median sternotomy, or a clamshell incision. Clamshell is nothing but a bilateral thoracotomy. Only thing is that the thoracotomy at one uh, one side is slightly higher than the uh, other side, just to sort of see that the diaphragmatic excursion, excursions are taken care of. Uh, the minimally uh, invasive approaches would be either by wax or robotic. Uh, it was believed that all the nodules had to be manually palpated, and they believed that manual palpation was a very critical step in detecting pulmonary metastasis. And that is why there were some people who actually approached, uh, who advocated rather the open approach only. But subsequently, it has shown that you could use a minimally invasive approach and there was no statistical difference in survivals at either one three or five years and now minimally invasive approaches are the preferred approaches we tend to use what is called the uniportal approach that is in which you do a small access to a cotton you put a wound retractor and try to insert your hand and one tip is that you know you try to get your the shortest person or the person who has got the smallest fingers or the flexible fingers in case you have a doubt i think the person can actually go inside and try to feel some of the nodules the concept of bilateral tumors is there so in which you do what is called as a staged approach either you and for here also again the minimally invasive surgical approach is preferred the other way is to do a median sternotomy and access both the lesions on either sides or a clamshell approach that i traditionally actually said the extent of resection well it is pretty important uh, that r0 resection that is a tumor free margin resection is achieved and most of the times we do what is called as a lung sparing approaches it's not the traditional anat uh, anatomical approaches that we do but we tend to sort of do the non-anatomical resections or rather the wedge resections and it all obviously depends on the position of the nodules if the nodules are located in the periphery you could very easily wedge it if the nodules are located in the center part of the lung you may want, want to do what is called a lobectomy or very very rarely sometimes you could actually offer an lobectomy to these patients and it's also said that some of the centrally located tumors have a slightly poorer prognosis when compared to the nodules that are actually located in the periphery now when it comes to the number of nodules and there is some consensus document to say that less than three nodules if you do a resection it's much better prognostically for the patient but there have been series in which they have excised as many as 80 to 100 nodules and maximum of 250 nodule excisions have been done. So these are slightly bizarre, but more often than not, the numbers of limited nodules you select for patients. But this is just to give you a spectrum of what has been published in the literature. Recurrences have been pretty common, especially because considering the fact that it is a systemic disease, 20 to 80 percent of the patients would recover, would recur rather, sorry. And some people believe that uh, these could actually be a uh, missed residual disease at the time of an index surgery as well. 
And there are a large number of data that su suggest that a longer post metastatectomy disease free interval and a lesser number of metastases. This was a meta analysis published by Lee in 2018 in the PLOS one that they, they could have some better outcomes. We also had our series of osteosarcoma patients, and we found that about 22% of our patients undergoing a second metastatectomy. And the survivals of some of these patients, five year survival especially, was around 7.7%. And this is our data, which in fact it is exactly one month since this data has been published in the Journal of Cancer. And this is our experience of pulmonary metastatectomy. And we chose to do it in a single cohort of osteosarcoma patients. Our experience further show, uh, showed that a disease-free interval of more than two years were beneficial. There is an increasing disease-free survival. You could sort of the patients would actually do much better. Traditionally, what we had found is the histology, number, location, laterality. In many other series, was found to impact on the prognosis, but in our series, none of them seem to have an impact. So we concluded the, our series by saying that no patient or no fit patient rather should be denied the option of a pulmonary metastatectomy just because of certain isolated risk factors. And finally, coming to what is called as the oligometastatic disease, and this concept is very new, and it is it will take a lot of time for us to sort of uh, understand this concept of oligometastatic disease. This is not a, a completely new concept, although it's uh, sort of it's becoming increasingly popular at this point of time. It was proposed by Samuel Hellman in 1995. It is believed to be a state between a, between a localized disease and a metastatic disease. So you have at two ends of the spectrum, on one side you have the localized disease, the other end of the spectrum you have the metastatic disease. And these are patients which uh, who fall in between the spectrum. And as I said, the concept was that some of these patients could be cured by the addition of treatment for the primary lesion. So this was the concept of oligometastatic disease. So when it came to the definition, that means these are patients who have metastasis, but they have a limited number of metastasis. So some people divide it as oligometastasis and polymetastasis. Oligo meaning less, poly meaning more. So oligometastasis is a cohort in which limited number of metastasis. Again, there is no consensus to the extent of the metastasis. Some say three, some say five confined to certain subsites, again, some, some say three. So the common ESMO definition is up to five metastases and in up to three organs. Again, I think the philosophy of the oligometastatic disease is that we must do a multimodality approach. This concept is more largely applicable for cancers like the breast, colorectal, and prostate cancers, which metastasize to the lung. Again, systemic therapy is a very important. There is a lot of emerging buzz about immunotherapy, so immunotherapy is also used in these patients. And more importantly, the concept of oligometastasis is to give some form of local therapy directed at cure. The basic premise or the, the concept is when, whether, and how do we in, uh, integrate the local therapy to the systemic therapy. And then some cancers like, for example, bony sarcomas and renal cell carcinomas, traditionally, they don't respond much well to, to chemotherapies, whereas colorectal cancers and lung cancers, they respond very well to some of the systemic therapies and breast cancers, they do respond to hormonal therapy. So depending on, and also prostate cancers as well. So it depends on the setting on which primary you are treating. And more often, you find that there is now an increasing role of immunotherapy in the treatment of these cancers, especially the renal cell cancers, melanomas and the lung cancers in the metastatic setting. Uh, more often they uh, not, they tend to use upfront targeted therapies or immunotherapies. And we have a tumor agnostic approval for pembrolizumab. The recent, very recently, FDA had approved it a couple of days back for any of our cancers. But what is more important is how we decide on what local therapy that we give to these patients. Essentially, it is that these are patients with limited metastasis. Some of these lesions or some of the primaries could be treated with initial systemic therapies. And based on the response, you would add some local therapy, like for example, a surgery or a stereotactic radiotherapy or SABR. The advantage of surgery is that it is a time-tested phenomenon. I think surgery has been time-tested. 
you can actually achieve an R0 resection in some of these in many of these patients, and the follow-up is very much predictable in these patients. And more importantly, by incorporating surgery as a local therapy for some of these patients, what we do is we could get some tissue for molecular typing and targeting, which is very, very important uh, part of the oligometastatic concept. The new kid in the block is, of course, um, SBRT or, or SABR. It is called a stereotactic radiotherapy, or it's also called a stereotactic ablative radiotherapy, which is basically a hypofractionated radiation therapy. So instead of surgery as a local modality of treatment, a lot of centers have, a lot of series have used radiation therapy as a local modality of treatment. The only premise is that it is a non-invasive nature and there is a likely very less toxicity because of radiation therapy vis-a-vis -vis compared to surgery as was seen in many of the series. But in the initial series of SBRT, the problem was that it did not mandate a biopsy of the nodules. So as I said, in one third of the nodules, you assume it to be metastasis, but they could turn out to be benign. So the risk was that you would you were giving radiation therapy to hematomas or any of the benign lesions. But the newer therapies of SBRT, your newer clinical trials, what they say is they mandate a biopsy of the of the lung metastasis so that you can accurately give radiation therapy and target it to that particular lesion. So of course it's a growing modality despite the lack of robust evidence. The scope of uh, SBRT is pretty huge. Initially, the, this therapy was used only in the unfit or unsuitable patients, that is in patients who could not undergo a pulmonary metastatectomy for some reasons, you could offer SBRT to these patients. But with more precise, it's been more used more often in the oligometastatic setting. And in certain cases of lung cancers, it has been used in uh, as a modality of treatment per se. So what's the mechanism of action? It induces direct tumor cell kill, but there is an added component of immune modulation. That is the effect of SBRT could actually not just be directly on the tumor, but also could be the surrounding stroma on the field. This effect is called the ascopal effect. And it is very important in the combination of SBRT with immunotherapy in many cancers. So now which modality do you choose and what is the comparative evidence there are a lot of data of comparing SBRT versus surgery. And a lot of these trials actually said the overall survival uh, was not much different, whether you choose surgery or whether you choose radiation therapy in the form of SBRT. But the progression-free survival was definitely more with surgery. And that was there in at least even in the latest series by Lee et al. But then uh, when, when there is an indefinite uh, or uh, answer, then there comes the meta-analysis to help. But this was the meta-analysis that actually came about last week, was published in the Future Science. Uh, more than 79 patients, uh, more, more than 79 studies rather, and 61 articles for surgery was compared with 18 articles of radiation therapy. And what they found is that in terms of short-term survival, there was not much difference whether you chose SBRT or surgery. But definitely a progression-free survival, surgery was better. Long-term outcomes, surgery was better. Mortality and morbidity, I think, is, was much, not much different between both the groups. So what the study meta-analysis concluded, they said that surgical metastatectomies has a low, robust follow-up and it could remain the preferred method. But SBRT, that is the radiation, is an attractive option, but the long-term follow-up is actually limited for these patients. The meta-analysis also said that it is very difficult to draw a line saying that one modality is superior to the other. It all depends on the clinical context. And there are a lot of ongoing clinical trials to actually address this. Now, how, we take, how do we take all this data into the clinic? So when we select a local therapy for an oligometastatic disease, or how do we actually go about selecting a patient for a metastatectomy? You select the biologically favorable, like small tumor burden, absolutely no lymph node metastasis, and there is a lot of theory in this. And longer disease-free interval, and we showed it now, even in our data, more than two years, um, developing metastasis, they tend to do well. Sometimes as a part of the systemic therapy, if you give a prior systemic therapy and the patients have responded well, these patients tend to do well. And obviously, patients with a better performance status do well. And as we have seen in, in the studies that you could give either surgery or SBRT based on the current scenario. But what was important in the ultimate prognosis of the patients is 
what was the baseline characteristic of the patients and how they well they responded to other therapies and your choice of giving systemic therapies beyond that. So definitely, we would consider SBRT in patients who were unwilling for surgery, who had a fitness <clears throat> that, who, that was suspect uh, for not having surgery. But certain tumors of hilar resection, as I said, like a pneumonectomies or lobectomies are not are very rarely performed in the metastatic setting. And if you have a hilar location, <clears throat> there could be a consideration for SBRT in these patients. And very rarely in a setting in which multiple bilateral tumors in which you find that you will not be able to get a good functional reserve in these patients, you may choose to uh, offer SBRT over surgery. There are other options. It's not just only uh, local modality of surgery versus radiation therapy. The options also could be radiofrequency ablations, laser assistance, infrared imaging, and there is something called as an isolated lung perfusion with uh, melphalan. And all these, we have much, much less evidence. We have maximum evidence for surgery, slightly lesser but more, more popular evidences in favor of stereotactic radiation therapy. And subsequently, you have some evidences pertaining to RFA mainly, but all other things, especially the ILP with melphalan, we'll have to do it under a clinical trial. So the final take of the oligometastatic concept was, yes, it does the, uh, is whether it is actually a concept that is actually really there today. Yes, it is very much there. In fact, if you see a lot of conferences, especially of the lung cancer in the last World Congress, there was at least eight sessions actually dedicated to this concept of oligometastatic. So it's a very in thing. The definition, of course, is slowly getting resolved. As I said, a lot of the centers are actually following the definition of, of about five site, uh, five lesions and less than three organs. The concept is very, very relevant. Whether you offer a local therapy in the presence of an oligometastatic disease, yes, there is emerging evidence, even in the present ASCO that happened uh, in the virtual in June, in June 2020. We found a paper on lung cancer which showed that it is beneficial. Which modality to use? Again, you could use surgery or radiation therapy based on your practice. And immunotherapy, as I said, it has actually changed the way in which we are practicing. Immunotherapy was uh, had made major inroads in the metastatic setting and now slowly it is coming in, in the concept of even oligometastatic disease. And a lot of these patients, as I said, they are getting tumor agnostic approvals. And with immunotherapy, we are seeing remarkable responses. So how these therapies of local therapies will fan out in the immunotherapy era is something that is very interesting for us to see. The concept of oligometastatic disease is actually extending. And there is this of multiple metastases or the polymetastatic disease. That is, a patient of any cancer with multiple metastatic disease was actually never ever considered uh, potentially curative. So, but what this concept of oligometastatic has done is that if a patient of polymetastatic disease, that is, if the patient has a number of metastases and you give an appropriate systemic therapy or immunotherapy and it does induce a good response in this patient, these patients are called induced oligometastases. That is, the, they try to give aggressive local therapies for such patients. So what we have, we are seeing an evolution of sort. Previously, even any metastasis, we never used to sort of bother and treat. Then came the concept of oligometastatic disease. That is a limited metastasis disease. You tend to give systemic therapy first and then consider some form of local therapy. And now, even in a multi-metastatic disease, you have excellent targeted therapies and immunotherapies that actually make the patients to remarkably respond so that they have some limited amount of metastasis and you try to give some form of local therapy in the form of surgery or radiation therapy in an attempt to cure that, that exceptional responder for these patients. So the future is that you know now what we are doing is we are just selecting patients based on the responses for therapy. And there are not much of biomarker based responses. In fact, even the diagnosis of metastasis or oligometastasis is done by simple imaging and we know how inaccurate imaging can be and so there are certain imaging biomarkers that are coming up that will be able to better classify whether a disease is genuinely oligometastatic or not. There is also an increasing rule or role of circulating tumor cells and CT DNA especially in the setting of polymetastatic disease to actually see the tumor which is there in the bloodstream and the response criteria for these patients. 
And there have been a lot of series that have actually shown that multiple rounds of local treatment, especially stereotactic radiation therapy, can be given in the setting of, of oligometastatic disease and possibly polymetastatic disease as well. So I must say that this is a very exciting thing. I know this topic is slightly niche. It's, 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 it, it contained a lot of terminologies. It is definitely confusing, but this is the in thing. Uh, as I said, as oncologists, we try to see that we want to, to sort of make the best for our patients. There was a time in which lung cancers, for example, in 1995, there were, there, any metastatic lung cancer would sort of, you know, not be sort of treated at all. But what is happening at this present point of time is with the advent of a lot of targeted therapies, now we are seeing survivals in lung cancers close to four years or eight years or even 11 years. And there is a concept of cure also that's happening. So this may sound a little lofty at this point of time, because the reason is a lot of these therapies, especially the immunotherapies are pretty costly and out of reach for the, uh, the common man who is practicing in the community. But this is where oncology is actually heading. There is this concept of aggressive intrathoracic therapy that is coming in which certain tumors, either oligometastasis or polymetastasis, are given some targeted therapies or immunotherapies. Based on the response, they, some of them are taken up for metastasis. Well, pre-metastatic definitely has a role in these patients. So what I'm trying to say is that the, the concept of surgery for these patients is increasing. Initially, uh, metastatic patients would never come to a, to a surgeon. Now, with advent of better therapies like targeted therapies and immunotherapies, and especially if patients who are actually responding to them very well, some of these patients are coming to us as surgeons, or some of them would come to the radiation oncologists, and a fraction of them who are exceptionally responding can be potentially cured. And that's exactly the concept of oligometastatic and polymetastatic disease. And pulmonary metastatectomy is definitely a major role to play in the treatment of such patients. But I must say these such decisions are very, very complex. I don't know whether I managed to sort of convince you or confuse you during the course of my therapy because a lot of this was, was slightly, uh, slightly bit, uh, uh, very slightly niche, but then Dr. Pata wanted me to discuss on, uh, on uh, thoracic malignancies. And I felt that uh, as general surgeons, a lot of us would be treating cancers and a lot of cancers would logically metastasize. So I think I just gave you whatever the scope of options of treatment uh, of metastatic disease from oligo to the polymetastatic disease. And uh, I would be happy to sort of answer any question. I must say that the final decision is actually to take a multidisciplinary tumor board because as you see, in this treating these patients, you would require not just a surgeon, but a radiation therapist and a medical oncologist among all the specialties. So treatments for oligometastatic and polymetastatic disease have to be ma made in a multi-tumor board decision and it has to be made on a case by case basis. So I rest my case now and uh, thank you, Dr. Pata, for the opportunity. A lovely lecture yet again, Arvind, because, uh, you know, this is a niche area and you always talk from your experience and from your heart rather than, you know, from the literature. Uh, I mean, it's a very special area. I'm sure everybody should understand that, the, you know, pulmonary medicine is not the end of the road and, you know, some of them can be salvaged. Thanks. I think there are some questions in the chat box, but before that, Dr. Srinivasan wants to come in to comment. Yes. No, no comment, sir. I am a, I am a yeah, kindergarten student regarding this one. <laughs> <laughs> Only thing, I don't know whether it's due to lack of time, a bit slow would have been better, sir, please. <laughs> Just a suggestion. <laughs> sure, 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 sir. Because we are sick, uh, supposed to take some notes. <laughs> no, no, this is, but I think, uh, Dr. Patta has been kind enough to share it, uh, some of them in his yes, channel sir, and sir. some of them, so we can definitely, you know, a lot of these concepts, I agree, sir, they are slightly niche and slightly new. I think uh, I just wanted to give a flavor to everybody to sort of, you know, yes, and understand, no, no, and I'm sure that, I'm sure that everybody should go back, read, and, and because this is, there are so many primaries that actually metastasize to the lung and to give a one hour talk of, of a, for pulmonary metastasis is very difficult and I actually try to do something of the impossible, I must say. Fantastic, sir. Keep it up. Thank you. But there are some uh, questions in the chat box. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at that, sir. Do you do a plain HRCT or contrast enhanced uh, uh, CT? <clears throat> Yeah, I think, um, as I said, uh, CT scan is, is uh, important. 
you could do either a plane or contrast but more importantly i will tell you that this is an area of metastasis disease so we often tend to use a pet ct scans and sometimes in the follow up of these patients we tend to use ct scans so our preference would actually be to use more amount of pet ct scans before uh, labeling this patient because one of the important criteria as i said of uh, thumbs for criteria was absence of intra or extra thoracic disease of course with the concept of oligometastatic disease uh, more and more the reliance is on pet ct scan for initial staging and also for response to therapies so and you also asked about uh, what lesions do you approach by clamshell uh, clamshell incision was something that you know we used to regularly do when i was training at the tata memorial it is essentially that you know the, the, when the lung metastases are there in both sides of the lung that is in the right side and say in the left side so you tend to do it in the same setting so what we used to do is we used to take say normally your thoracotomy either and the antro in this case you would do an antrolateral thoracotomy either it could be in the fourth space or the fifth space in one of the sides you used to do it in the fourth space and one of the sides in the fifth space or obviously it all depends on the where the lesion is so this is a sort of an open approach but as i said like you know we have completely shifted right now to the minimally invasive approaches we rarely very rarely do an open surgery for metastatectomies um, at this point of time of course it all depends on the size of the metastasis but quite often we tend to use a uniport approach that is you do a small utility sort of incision put the wound retractor and try to sort of you know in case it's very difficult for sub centimeter nodules to palpate you tend to put your hand in. and in this case i must tell you that you know you try to keep a very very person whose hands are very small so that it can actually go and fit into the incision because if you put a larger incision for a minimally invasive surgery the whole purpose of actually doing the minimally invasive surgery is actually tend to get lost yeah so clamshell <clears throat> you can use when you have bilateral metastases but i would say that this is a less preferred option we tend to use minimally invasive approach or sometimes you can actually do a sternotomy uh, to actually get better access to these patients uh, somebody has asked the uh, role of intraoperative ultrasound yes i did mention very briefly we tend to use more amount of the manual palpation if at all or there are certain uh, forceps that are available max forceps that are available you can actually use them to sort of you know give the haptic feedback for you but as i said manual palpation is always uh, is 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 the best in terms of it but you can actually do with um, with better imaging modalities that we have now you are able to accurately localize the amount of nodules which are there and we we yes very rarely you could use intra we have not used intraoperative ultrasound in these cases but uh, intraoperative ultrasound as i said has been sort of used in not just here but it's more commonly used in liver lesions but yeah you can tend to use it in the lung lesions as well any size criteria for sbrt <clears throat> uh, in fact they say up to around say about 3 to 5 cm but even larger lesions some people have actually uh, subjected to sbrt so per se i think it's just you must get the volumetric um, uh, or the dosimetric rather correct and in fact what they say is uh, some of them actually go to go for tumors which are slightly larger as well so any any nodule around 3 to 5 cm would be actually good and actually this is data which is extrapolated from the use of um, sbrt in, in early stage lung cancers as well stage resection so sort of ask the stage resection for bilateral metastatectomies what would be the interval <clears throat> yeah i think this is a very important question um, some people tend to use it uh, in in a same setting you know? so or what what we tend to do rather is we tend to do it staged uh, and uh, we send the patient home again what happens is if you are following a minimally invasive approach the patient doesn't take much time to sort of you know heal and come back so you can do it as quickly as the wound healing actually happens you need not wait so that's the beauty of doing a minimally invasive approach if you are doing a thoracotomy on uh, side then you may have to wait because the patient may have some symptoms it may take some time to recover but if you are doing the minimally invasive approach i think you can take the patient as early as possible for the staged surgery 6 weeks is suggested but as i said you can uh, by the use of a minimally invasive approach you can sort of reduce that time I think there is somebody who is chatting within yourself. Why should it be six weeks? Is there any factor? Yeah, I, I, I did answer that. I think uh, Dr. Saurav was sort of uh, sort of said uh, the answer to that. What surgery was done the first site? Vats, 
yeah, yeah. Maybe I think it's it is a continuation of the same question, I guess. Like you know, so uh, as I said, uh, minimally invasive surgery, uh, and you can sort of you know choose either side based on your convenience. And uh, uh, with a lot of use of minimally invasive approaches, I think it's uh, the time per se is not sacrosanct. You can use it uh, as early as possible. Which side to operate first? Uh, I think there is no uh, major distinction criteria like this. I think it's a question of choice. Uh, which which side like um, you can sort of you know do it. I, at the end of the day, uh, what is more important is that you know you should select whether this patient will get an R0 resection or not. And that is very very important. And uh, case selection is very important. That uh, the side in which you do it first or second doesn't really matter as long as you're able to get an R0 resection and you must be fully satisfied that the patient has got a good functional reserve. And this is especially true when you're doing bilateral cases. In bilateral cases, the functional reserve of the patients, uh, you must sort of you know, have some mechanism to sort of you know, see and calculate. Generally, what happens is that a lot of the osteosarcoma patients tend to sort of get more metastatic pain as we have observed in our series. The reason is a lot of them tend to be adolescent age group. And they are young, they are fitter, and even testicular cancers for, for that matter. So most of the patients who are actually sort of younger and fitter, they tend to sort of, you know, take withstand a lot of surgeries. These are with colorectal surgeries. What happens is in these metastases, the patients tend to be a little older. So I think this might be one of the reasons why I think our oster the metastases that we have done for osteosarcoma far, far outnumbers the metastases that we have actually done for colorectal very nice. Thank you, Saurabh, for your appreciation. I was not sure how much, how many people would sort of, you know, appreciate this talk. Yeah. And uh, please tell a little about the role of lymph node dissection now. I think it's, it's. I think you hit, hit the nail. I think that really very, very important question. Uh, lymph node dissection in pulmonary metastasis is a very important factor. In fact, it is very, very important from the prognostic point of view. What people, what we know for sure is that if the patient has got a lymph node in a pulmonary metastasis, these patients do very poorly. And that's the reason why even like, for example, there was a small question there that was done for, say, scenarios in which, which were considered oligometastasis. If there is a patient with a lymph node positive metastasis that you know a priori, then the question of actually taking up this patient or considering the patient as oligometastasis itself is slightly suspect. So lymph node issues, especially in lung cancers, are very, very poor prognostically. And sometimes you may not actually label the mesh patient osteo oligometastasis and not take up these patients for surgery. And coming specifically to your question of lymph node dissection, uh, there is again a divided house based on this. A lot of people actually say that you must do, you, you actually go, I'll tell you the practical way out is, you actually see your CT scans for these some of these patients. And intraoperatively, you must examine some of these nodes. And a lot of surgeons may not do a systematic lymph node dissection as you do it for a lung cancer, but they definitely would do some sort of a sampling for these patients. And the reason they do a sampling is that if you come to know that these nodes are positive, then you know that this patient will not do well in the long run. So you would, you would actually think of alternate strategies for the treatment of these patients. Manish, a uh, few doubts. Yeah, what is the definition of oligometastasis? The same for each primary. Well, Manish, I think as I said, the definition keeps evolving. There is an ESMO consensus document that has come that says, like you know, but if you see different series have got different definitions. What oligometastasis? I think you just go by the pure terminology. Oligo meaning less, so it has less number of metastasis. It could be less in a particular organ or less in all. So what I say is five metastases in all and less than three organs. But I think the definition which changes trial by trial and it is very important that you know that we have a standard acceptable definition for oligometastases. I know if you read a lot of these trials, the definition would be much different. But the ESMO definition is something that by broad consensus, a lot of uh, thoracic surgeons or uh, the oncologists would sort of prefer. Need for a needle biopsy before surgery. No, if you are doing surgery, I think that's the beauty of doing surgery. In fact, I would rather say that you know you must do definitely do a biopsy if you are planning a stereotactic radiation therapy as a modality of treatment for these patients. The reason, as I said, a third of the nodules could be different uh, in the earlier population, 
and uh, in what they used to do is there was a risk of you know actually radiating benign nodules or hematomas if you don't do. so the modern definition actually says that you must biopsy one, at least one of the nodules to actually prove it is a metastasis disease when it comes to surgery you are removing the nodule right so i think uh, you may not actually but then to actually prove some of these nodules if they are slightly suspect or borderline you may actually go about and do a pre operative needling on these particular patients so again a question is what to do for contralateral rung nodule in ls clc in eight stage in ls yeah i think this is a very important question i, I think this is uh, actually not uh, truly uh, 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 metastasis in the sense what happens is that this is also a spectrum of oligometastatic disease in three scenarios in lung cancers we tend to resect uh, if i were to answer your question <clears throat> when there is a solitary brain metastasis when there is a contralateral nodule as you have put it in this case and when there is a solitary adrenal metastasis so these are this question is more pertinent to the answering of lung cancers and these are the three scenarios where wherein we would actually go ahead and operate these lesions with a potentially curative effect in all other scenarios especially in lung cancers we tend to follow the approach of trying to sort of you know it is very important in lung cancers to do a molecular testing for these patients so a lot of these patients would undergo some sort of testing egfr al cross pdl1 and based on that if they have oligometastatic disease more often than not other than the three settings they tend to give some systemic therapy and then you consider local therapy later chance of radiation pneumonitis is high for more than 5 cm yes very important uh, dr harish i think you are absolutely right uh, uh, a, a lot of the people think that sbrt is something that is uh, not without any problems in fact uh, even in the cyber comet uh, series that uh, phase 2 randomized control trial you did have a couple of uh, radiation deaths and a lot of radiation pneumonitis as well happening so it's not that sbrt is something that is uh, not without any problems but having said that i think uh, uh, the radiation oncologists would argue saying that you know even surgery for metastasis you have some morbidity and mortality so i'm not contesting that the evidence actually says that you know both surgery and radiation therapy have almost equivalent morbidity and mortality especially if you are doing in skilled hands so any duration manish is again again asking for oligo recurrence I, i manish there is nothing i think i i didn't dwell too much into this because i i really thought there are as i said there are two three concepts of uh, oligo recurrence oligo progression and oligo persistence and i think um, There, there is actually no time limit you actually go and uh, try to sort of you know see how the response for therapies in these patients are essentially and then take a call and uh, uh, like in thyroid cancers we discussed a dynamic risk stratification even in these lung cancers or oligometastatic lung cancers there is what is called as a dynamic staging that is a polymetastatic patient would actually based on your risk response could become oligometastasis so what what really uh, i would like to sort of just for more clarity I, uh, is that sometimes what happens is some of these patients respond very well and eventually what happens is they tend to get resistance and some of these disease grow so that is what they call as oligo uh, recurrence uh, uh, as what manish has described in his sort of question so i think the scenarios are nine different types i don't uh, really want to go into each of these scenarios but there are nine different types of responses that we get and based on the response i think the therapy is going to be decided based on that so harish thank you any role of photodynamic therapy in the patients with uh, photodynamic therapy in fact uh, you could use photodynamic therapy sort of but then I, i as i said for endoluminal or bronchial obstructions then we have a lot of uh, other therapies like uh, you could do some uh, some laser therapies you could also do some endoluminal stenting for these patients and you could do uh, any other uh, intraluminal radiation therapy is also for these patients so most of these settings like for example what you are asking is a scenario of palliation in what we are been talking all along is in the oligometastatic setting we are trying to sort of do something which is curative for these patients so this is a actual di distinction that one needs to understand 
for symptomatic palliation of metastasis we can uh, do a lot of different things and yes photodynamic therapy is an option but there is something that you don't really have the drug available right now in in india of course there are certain second third generation we have used photodynamic therapy in some of these cancers much earlier but um, yes it is definitely an option for uh, luminization for endobronchial obstruction Since Manish's final question: Since cancer progression model is different from different cancers, can metastasis develop independent of the primary tumor? Manish, you're really sort of you know, throwing a lot of uh, complexity to the whole problem. Yes, it is important. What is very important is that, uh, as I said, a lot, lot, many tumors metastasize to the lung, and they all behave behave differently. For example, as I said, the, let me talk of two common cancers. Like for example. osteosarcomas or or let me say sarcomas per se and colorectal these are the top two sort of cancers as i said like other cancers also do metastasize to the lung but then in case of prostate in case of breast you tend to rely more on systemic therapies and hormonal therapies in case of melanomas and kidney tumors you tend to rely more on the immunotherapies uh for the response but in some of these cancers like for example again in colorectal the problem is again you have good responses for uh, systemic therapies for these patients so in certain uh, so there is di a distinct uh, heterogeneity when it comes to actually the primary tumor definitely in sarcomas or osteosarcomas wherein you don't have really good agents i think the role of the surgeon becomes more and more important the role of the surgeons becomes slightly uh, complex when the tumors respond to sort of you know some of these uh, systemic therapy agents i think uh, i hope i answered your questions thank you yeah thank you all sir i am done with the questions over here <laughs> a lot of questions actually <laughs> I, I hope I, I don't know I, I was a little worried while trying to sort of deliver this talk because I, I I just wanted to know that because once you are giving a talk in a virtual world you don't really know whether you are making sense or yeah. <laughs> people <laughs> see by that was my thing the very reason there's so many questions it, you know these are areas not usually touched by anyone and people have a lot of doubts anyway as a as a nice lecture any other question a couple of them might raise their hands and then went off um any anybody from the audience before we close the session i think uh, there's enough of uh, clarity after all this uh, question answer session thanks uh, arvin thanks so much for your effort and uh, we shall meet you in the next lecture thank you sir thank you so much again thank you thank you thank you